Philip Roche came out with a, a commentary in July, speaking specifically the, about the bond market and his call that you know he thought in the near term we'd see a rise in yields, and we have since since that letter came out. Um, and and again, he as you point out thinks that maybe four and a half on the ten year. Uh, I'll just show you a chart where the ten year is now, so you can kind of we can kind of visualize that together. But here, here's a chart of the ten year. Um, and you can see here we've had a pretty sharp rise here uh, over the last. Uh, this is a this is a monthly chart, so you can see the last um, you know four or five months has been a pretty sharp rise. Right here is where four and a half is. So his fair value move is not very much further from here. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Welcoming you back here at the end of the week. Uh, I'm joined by the lead partners from New Harbor Financial who join me every week, um, both to do kind of a recap of, of the major interviews that we've run this week, but also talk about what the markets are up to. Joined as usual by John Lodra and Mike Preston. Guys, great to see you. We don't have a ton of time here, so let's just jump right in. Um, first, guys, I'd like to get your reaction to the Peter Atwater uh, video that we released yesterday. Um, Peter, great behavioral economist. Um, definitely seems more concerned than he's ever been since I've talked with him about this growing uh, wealth divide. And uh, and obviously, he's not super sanguine about where markets are, are headed from here. But I think he's more concerned about sort of societally how all this is going to end up. Um, let's see. Um, Mike, I uh, was able to talk with John last week about uh, Neil Howe in the fourth turning. Why don't we talk with you about uh, your response here to Atwater, and, and then John will bring you in. Yeah, Adam, uh, Peter talks about some big picture ideas, some big picture kind of sweeping over time ideas, but these are really important societal things that we're seeing. And the biggest one that Peter talked about here was the wealth disparity. The wealth disparity has uh, increased significantly over the last 15 years, and it's become really pretty obscene. There, You, know, you can look at some of the data. We don't have any of the charts ready at our fingertips here today, but the bottom 40 to 50% really by and large has been has been left out of this, this big bubble these last 15 years. They've been left out of the wealth effect. In fact, the um, you know, their spendable dollars, their spendable real income has declined over the last 10 to 15 years, while the very top few percent has seen an explosion in their wealth. And so Peter talks about how that's never a good sign for society. The more extreme the wealth gap is, the more ultimately dangerous it is, and we're more likely to have a conflict. You mentioned Neil Howe uh, and his new book, The Fourth Turning is Here. Um, I think that you said in, in the video, Adam, that we're roughly halfway through the fourth turning. It, by my estimation, we're probably a little further than that. You know, Neil thinks that we started the fourth turning in 2008. That was 15 years ago. Turnings, whether they're fourth, first or second or third turnings, last about 20 years. So we probably have about five years left in this fourth turning, which is likely to be a climactic phase. And this comes at a time where everything is lining up. You can see that we have maximum effort going into the economic side of things. Maximum effort is a hallmark of a fourth turning. <clears throat> and that's what we're seeing here. There's a, there's a Herculean effort to keep prices of everything up. Because if that doesn't happen, then the debt can't be serviced properly. And that's a real risk to the to the real fabric of our economy and really bad things happen if that falls apart. So, you know, this all started after the financial crisis, this operation twist and tarp and, and all the different phases of quantitative easing has just shot prices for homes through, through the roof. Um, stock market's gone to the moon. We sit at the most overvalued point in U S history with a Schiller price earnings ratio well into the 30s, and it's into the 40s or even 50 if you adjust it for profit margins, which we think is statistically, excuse me, the right thing to do. So we've got this wealth divide, and it's going to be a problem. Nobody knows what the catalyst is, what is going to be the spark that creates the problem. That's really what's kind of perplexing everybody. So that's primarily what Peter talked about. He also talked about the notion that well, everyone thinks there's going to be a recession, so there can't be a recession. You know, that kind of contrarian thinking. Um, there, there almost certainly will be a recession. The question is, 
whether or not the Fed and central banks will respond, whether or not they'll be as successful as they were in March of 2020 when the recession lasted all of four weeks. You know, who knows? We're talking to a lot of individuals that are business owners that are in various different industries that have said that the first six months of this year have slowed dramatically. And these are folks that are in transportation, luxury goods, RV sales, construction, all kinds of different industries, and things are slowing down. And, you know, this is all while FOMO is back and, and people are afraid of missing out on the next hot stock. And, and yet it's still only seven stocks that are dragging this market higher. So, you know, ultimately we're in a pretty dangerous place and it's, you know, it really wasn't something that we can control. The Federal Reserve decided this for us. <clears throat> That's the bad part about it is they decided this for us. And structurally we have, a, I think, a more dangerous society in a more dangerous future because of it and um, to me that's what the talk was all about so i'll pause there for a minute all right um good summary and, and john i want to get to you in just a second because i think you have some uh some visuals there that speak to um you know what mike was saying about how you know we're sort of being told everything's rosy but if you look under the hood you don't have to look that that deeply beneath it um we see a lot of evidence that things really aren't that great um, Mike, I just wanted to make one comment um, about the timing of the the, the fourth turning. Uh, Neil mentioned that this time around, um, we're, we're seeing an expansion of the uh, the time windows for the this latest turning, and and one reason for that that he notes is that uh, the older generations are holding on to the reins of power a lot longer, and the younger ones are taking longer to launch. And so he said that sort of demographic dynamic is sort of slowing the general progression of, of the fourth turning, um, therefore making it take a little bit longer. So he's oh, thinking this thing could, could really, the end could be maybe be out in the early 2030s at this point yeah. in time. So um, this is a 30 year turning. I didn't catch that in his talk. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it may be. I mean, we never know, yeah. right? There's, there's nothing's guaranteed here, but yeah, he, he was saying, yeah, this one actually could last into 2030. Um, all right. So, John, uh, to you, um, uh, love to get any general reactions you have as well to, to Peter's talk. Um, but I, I know you do have some of those visuals about how, you know, um, we're, we're being told everything's fine. And, and, and history is actually pretty, pretty full, chock full of times where we were told everything was fine. And that was right before the rug got pulled out from under us. Yeah, I enjoyed his talk uh, as a behavioral economist. Um, I really enjoyed some of the things he called out of, of where we are today. <clears throat> um, he, he hit upon some of the, the, the terms like shared hopelessness. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that feed into fourth turning type events. And let us be clear. I mean, Mike and I and our team, you know, we're very cognizant of these big picture cycles, but we also realize the day to day moves a lot quicker than these cycles play out. So, so while we need to kind of build them into our investment mindfulness, um, you know, the day to day doesn't necessarily, um, it's not held captive to these bigger trends because they take they can take much longer to play out and there can be all kinds of um counter trends in markets along the way especially when you factor in the uh, behavioral and, and psychological component which is so so pronounced uh in in the shorter term um uh, uh you know movements of markets and that's what i really appreciated about um peter's comments he talked about you know this this year's rally being very narrow like we've talked about uh, the mag seven yeah there's been an expansion but he contrasted that to so so the confidence has been very narrow in the market really right and it's almost been uh the 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 uh, headlines about why this market can go higher have largely been more about um momentum well it's going to go higher because it it always does when momentum indicators like this happen, rather than, hey, look at these fundamental um, earnings, look at these fundamental uh, breadth indicators and things like that as the reason for the market to go higher. And he contrasts that with a little bit of like the 2020, you know, the meme, you know, uh, broad, almost anything that had had a meme with it went up. So there was like this very broad confidence. He And I think it's a very important thing. He he. he I think the takeaway from that is you like this this confidence is very narrow, which also means it can turn on a dime. We start to see some faltering on these very narrow segments of the market that have 
bolstered whatever shallow confidence there is, it could just as quickly move in reverse. And we we agree with that. I'll let you interject yeah, here. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. I can't remember what I referred to this as, but almost like like a conservative speculative speculation or a conservative confidence, where yep. as you said, John, you know, um we, we're we're coming out of an era where confidence was very high and that was reflected in speculation and everything. I mean, honestly, speculation and kind of the trashiest opportunities anyone could think of from SPACs to meme stocks to random cryptos, et cetera. Right? And what he's saying right now is you're, yes, you're seeing a confidence that's powering the, the market higher, but it's a safe confidence. It's just confidence in what has worked to date, which is these magnificent seven stocks, right? And to your point, it's kind of rather than multiple pillars that the confidence is placing its bets on, it's really just placing its bet on this one pillar. Yeah. And if that pillar, you know, gets topples in any way or gets wobbly, then the whole system gets wobbly. Yeah, you know, the other thing I really appreciated, he, he uh, contrasted um, the notion of wanting to search for a cause versus a story, right? And he used the, the analogy of, of when I think it was Boeing, Boeing was having some en engine problems with their new uh, new air, air, airplanes and, and uh, you know, people to feel safe didn't want to know the cause. They wanted to know the story as to why they, why they need to be safe. And and the the parallel here is that in in markets that defy fundamentals and and logic, they usually get caught up in stories. And in fact, masses of investors start to tell themselves stories as to why this is not something to be worried about. And that's because we're, we're we're humans. I mean, for yeah, for cognitive dis dissonance or whatever. Yeah. Time. Yeah. And, and he points to, for example, um, the near universal story um, that we've averted recession. Everybody from the Fed to talking heads to, you know, uh, at home investors have have either spun their own story or have seen news media stories about, hey, this is going to be a soft landing or no landing. And in fact, I'll share a chart here just to kind of put that uh, into a little little kind of. Um, pictorial here. So this is a chart showing um, appearances of hard landing versus soft landing in news stories. And you can see an absolute off the charts rise uh, in, in soft landing kind of um, topical articles in, in the news media in, in, in recent weeks and months. Um, and uh, yet we know if we go back and look at history, um, that, that almost always is universally the case at major turning points. Here's just a random selection. Uh, right in, in October of 2007, almost to the day uh, of the very the peak of the, the market in 07 before it dropped uh, over 60% between late 07 and early early uh, uh, 09. Um, you know, you can read the headlines here. They pretty much say kind of the things we're hearing today. 2000, right at the tippity top of the tech bubble, pretty much. And then 1990, this is just a, a, just a random selection. But the point is made that, you know, once you have these stories, um, Kind of taking hold, it's it's almost a, a perfect contrarian indicator in history. In his, if history is any guy, when it's so pervasive, and Peter Peter said very forcefully in his his opinion that that is almost the best predictor of a recession when when no one expects it. And you might even say, and you pointed out that because it was so universally expected late last year that um, you know it didn't happen, and and maybe now is not believed to be happened because of that. So that's a really fascinating and, and frustrating for us um the way that psychology can can really play uh, a role in the short-term markets and, and ignore some of the bigger pictures one other thing i want to i want to uh, um, catch upon and this gets back to his his i think it's the confidence map he talks about and i think he said confidence is really a combination of certainty and control right and the alternative to that is vulnerability and i think it, when it comes to investing the degree to which people feel certainty and control itself is very largely a psychological thing, right? It's what they believe that dictates the level of certainty and control. And that's what can cause real willful blindness. Um, what I'd like to say, though, is, is that there are actually really ways to actually use tools to exert certainty and control. So, for example, we've, we've often talked about our use of hedging tools. We can, we can basically use option hedges, for example, as a way to take an otherwise unknown and unknowable future and put some certain bands around it. Um, so, for example, we can say, you know, hey, 
we, we can give you upside in a certain index or whatever of, of X percent. Uh, and if you're willing to give away upside beyond that, we can use that as currency to guarantee through the purchase of put options, for example, um, that you will have no more downside than, than X percent, right? Here's a way you can transplant psychological, maybe ill-founded certainty can, can control with actual tools that can provide that. So it, it you don't have to be subject to your own psychological and, and collective psychological prison. I, th I think it's just a fascinating you know, idea. Certainty control is what makes people really confident about investing when sometimes it's the, the misleading stories they're told or that they tell themselves that, that give rise to that certainty and control. So I'm glad you mentioned that because because that is one of the benefits that a good financial advisor right brings to an investor right is is they can kind of protect them from the emotional whipsawing that drives most of us because we're human animals and talked a lot about this recently you know folks like Dan Ariely and and you know other behavioral economists and whatnot um, and as you said there John you know you, you can you can come up with rules around position sizing and diversification and all that stuff that can take a lot of the emotional you know uh, infection of your decision making out of the equation right and and you know what's great about the case that you just made there is i'm always amazed that more people don't do that right i mean you're basically just saying look i can we can pretty much guarantee you won't lose more than x and your upside will still be Y, right? It, 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 we're, we're, we're removing some of the, you know, runaway opportunity uh, to make crazy gains, um, but those are low probability anyways, uh, to help you secure a good return with safety, right? And why it's always interesting to me that people don't take more advantage of that is because the, the research is really clear. The psychological research is really clear. People feel the pain of a loss. They experience the pain of a loss emotionally about twice as more powerfully than they feel the joy of a gain. And yet in investing, it tends to be the greed factor that most people are focused on most of the time. You know, we, we really don't see people really exercising prudence until oftentimes it's too late. You know, as Michael Gaia just said in the interview that ran earlier this week, he said, you know, the data actually shows that if for folks that get in a car crash, it's actually more common that people don't hit the brake. They don't. Their foot doesn't make it to the brake until act, after the impact's already happened, right? Um, and so, you know, in this case here, um, you know, because we know that we we feel the damage of a loss twice as much as we do the benefit of the gain. You think that normal status quo, pe people would be more focused on loss prevention. But we tend not to be, again, just kind of the way that we're wired and the narrative around the market is it's all around, you know, trying to get that big 10 bagger. Um, but, you know, again, you know, I, I think the tools of the type that you're talking about here, you know, for the prudent person to just to say, yeah, let me let me take my, you know, evolutionary caveman out of the equation <laughs> and let me rely more on, you know, just the cold, hard math uh, that's going to help me in the long run create more wealth. You're nodding as I'm saying all this. Yep, totally agree. Totally agree. Okay. All right. Well, look. Um, turning now into territory where um, we might be agitating people's lizard brains a little bit. Um, so, uh, one of the greats uh, of investing, the still living greats of investing, is Bill Gross. Um, managed uh, the largest bond portfolio for a large part of his career when he worked at Pimco. I uh, was referred to as the Bond King. I think that mantle has been passed on uh, now, now that Bill is sort of retired. But he's been in the media recently talking about uh, his level of concern right now. It sounds like he's actually saying right now he's bearish on both stocks and bonds. And so I want to get your guys' reactions to that. Um, and John, maybe I'll stick with you because I know you've got a couple of charts that you had pulled up and then we'll come to you, Mike. Um, but I think on, on, the, uh, on the bond side, he says he's still expecting prices to go down a little bit, at least in the near term. And in his eyes, he said he thinks uh, the U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury is fairly valued at about a 4.5% yield. And on the day we're talking here, it's a little bit above 4.2. So getting close, but not quite there. Right? And then on, on stocks, he says he's, he's bearish on them right now, mostly because of valuations. You know, he says if you look at the equity risk premium, which is the premium you get paid to be in stocks because they're more risky than bonds. 
said it's at like 20 year lows right now, you know, given how high uh, bond yields have risen and how overvalued stocks seem to be today. So, you know, he's he's basically kind of saying, hey, everybody, this is this is a time to be cautious. So anyways, John, I'll let you react and then Mike will come to you. Yeah, Bill, Bill Roche came out with a, a commentary in July speaking specifically about the, about the bond market and his call that, you know, he thought in the near term we'd see a rise in yields. And we have since since that letter came out. Um, and, and again, he, as you pointed out, thinks that maybe four and a half on the 10 year. Uh, I'll just show you a chart where the 10 year is now. So you can kind of we can kind of visualize that together. But here, here's a chart of the 10 year. Um, and you can see here we've had a pretty sharp rise here uh, over the last. Uh, this is a, this is a monthly chart. So you can see the last, um, you know, four or five months has been a pretty sharp rise right here is where four and a half is. So his fair value move is not very much further from here. Right. Right. And just to make it clear to folks, this this chart is charting the yield of the 10 year, not the price. Exactly right. And it's off by a decimal place, just the way our charting software does it. So 40, 42.35 is 4.235. And I'll show you a daily chart just to kind of zoom in a little bit here. You can see pretty big move here. It actually spiked up yesterday as high as uh, 4.27. It looks like 4.274 um, and pull, pull back a little bit. So, so yeah, there's been a, a pretty sharp rise here. Uh, and some of the reasons he he articulated for this, um, um, certainly quantitative tightening, you know, the continued runoff of the Fed's balance sheet as as they continue to do that. And I've I've lost track of the pace at which they're doing it, but it's certainly happening. Uh, he talked about Social Security entitlements and all those things, putting a, effectively putting a floor um, and, and likewise a floor on inflation, maybe in the three percent area. So the higher for longer camp, I guess you'd say he's in. And he, of course, talked about the the supply, the issuance uh, with the fiscal deficit. This none of this is rocket science. It's pretty simple takeaways, you know, with the dynamics that we have. That that that, uh, and but yet we have this big recessionary type thing that's hanging out there, which could be very supportive for bonds. So it's so it's 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 not entirely clear. And and this gets back to Peter Atwater's, you know, making sure your your pie chart. Um, is allocated not just across asset classes, but maybe more importantly across moves. So if you think about some of the most um, unloved asset classes right now, it's it's uh, it's it's bonds, longer term bonds, it's um, precious metals. We'll say candidly, has been an area that's been weak for us, even though we think there's very strong upside. Um, but so so the other thing, so I'm going to just kind of pivot a little bit here to another chart here, uh, and I'll stop sharing just so I can do that. Um, bear with me here. Uh, you know, the, the recent um, rise in yields has has also contributed to what we call, a, you know, an uninverging of, of the yield curves. Much of the last year or so, we've talked about a yield curve inversion, where the short end of the curve, short-term treasuries, for example, yield considerably higher than longer-term treasuries. And that's been the case for much of the past year and almost to record levels. Uh, but we've seen with the recent rise in longer-term yields, a slight uninversion so the inversion has become less extreme and this this chart was put out by fidelity it basically looks at analogs to prior times and this vertical line here is is where the so so far what looks like to be the peak inversion the most inverted point in the yield curve in this cycle uh in i think april of this year uh and it shows you know previous notable times in history and the lower panel basically shows the s p 500 uh, performance before and after that peak inversion. So here we are, right? it's kind of hard to see, but the current cycle is this, this thicker gray line and it comes right here. So you can see we've had a pretty good route run higher. And the, the key point on this chart, and we've talked about the, the real problem isn't the inversion of the yield curve, is, is when it becomes uninverted. That's usually when things start to break. And it's funny, we're not hearing much talk about that. We're hearing talk about soft landings, no landings, but no one seems to be talking about, hey, the yield curve has has started to uninvert ever so slightly. But that historically has been a major, major um, indicator of, of trouble. And in, in fact, this chart shows, with the exception of 1980, which is this line, um, the S&P 500 has always, you know, not further advanced from where it has so far this year without a decline first. So, for example, this yellow line you can see was 1973. It, it declined about 40% before resuming a, an upward move in the market. The only time, again, in this collection of data points was 1980. 1980 was almost 
apples and oranges with, with today. We, we had low, sing, we had single digit uh, PE ratios versus, as Mike already talked about, Schiller PEs over 30. Um, so, you know, historically speaking, this, this seems to fall in line with a trend that we're seeing. We had a recent pullback in the market. It's been modest so far, but we're starting to see some breath indicators turn down percentage stocks above their 50 and 200 day moving averages. You know, some of these things are starting to show a, a, uh, a heavy, you know, the market becoming heavy on itself. And, and we could certainly see more follow through. And of course, there's no guarantee that this is, you know, uh, uh, an indicator that will be foolproof and, and, and ring true in, the, in this instance. But we think the weight of evidence is likely that it will. All right. And, and John, can, can you go to your next slide, which yes. talks about why 1980 was such an outlier? Well, all right, so the blue line here is the Schiller PE ratio. And this is a PE ratio that's cyclically adjusted over 10 years. It smooths out a lot of the earnings uh, business cycle, which is a more robust indicator of future returns. But at the end of July, we were a little bit over 30. It's actually higher now uh, as we're here in August. Um, but the, the the orange line shows the uh, similarly cyc cyclically adjusted earnings yield. And this is basically a shorthand way to compare the, the return uh, of stocks and bonds or return potential. So the Schiller cyclically adjusted earnings yield right now is at 3.25. We just saw that 10-year treasuries are yielding um, 4.2, 4.25, somewhere in that ballpark, right? So simple takeaway is if, you were, if, if we were forced to hold passively either the S&P 500 or 10-year treasuries for the next 10 years and hold it to maturity, we would absolutely say 10-year treasuries. And that, that, that's not to say, because we agree with, with Bill Gross that over the, ten, the coming 10 years, we're, we're likely to see a bigger sell-off in treasuries at some point, even if there's a rally in the near term, which we think is quite possible. Um, but the, you know, zooming out, you see that the earnings yield is almost an inverse image of the PE ratio. Basically, when stocks get expensive, when the PE ratio is high, earnings yield, i.e. their competitiveness or attractiveness compared to bonds, becomes less so or actually downright unattractive and that's that's a pretty um historically reliable indicator and and uh you know we think that is something that investors right now should pay heed to yeah and just look at the difference there between today's conditions and 1980 and 1980 here's right here the 1980s right around here we had a pe ratio of schiller pe maybe eight and some change we're now over 30. i mean we're talking about a quarter you know a quarter of the valuation of of where we are today uh night and day difference completely uh apples and oranges all right so you know back back to your original or your previous chart there um that was the only outlier that didn't correct by some material amount after the uh, uninversion started and again no guarantees that history is going to follow that exact same trajectory but uh that was the only outlier and you just showed why its conditions don't really apply at all to what we see today. So, you know, if history is any guide, we should be cautious here. Um, you, you mentioned how, you know, the market is beginning to see a little bit of softness here. Um, I think we've lost somewhere around 200 S&P points or so um, over the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, you know, I do a weekly recap on this channel with Lance Roberts. He had been calling for a market pullback. He said somewhere between three to 10%. Uh, we're very much within that range right now. And, um, you know, Lance has said, uh, you know, he expected this pullback. You'll start seeing people at some point, he, he thinks, saying, hey, this was a bull trap uh, after all, and, and the market's rolling over here. He doesn't think that's going to be the case. He just thinks this is kind of the market ran too far too fast. This is going to be just a little bit of a pause that refreshes and then things will, will power higher. I mentioned that because I just recorded an interview that'll launch next week with options trader um, Imran Lakha. And he said he sees something similar in the options market where um, one, of the, one of the interesting indicators the option market can tell you is when um, traders are, are getting nervous because they buy more protection. And he said, we're not really seeing an increase in protection that you would expect to see right now if traders were getting concerned that the market was in danger of a real rollover here. You know, of course that can change. Um, but right now he said, we're not, we're not seeing that level of nervousness. So anyways, we'll come to you, Mike here, but uh, any commentary you want to have around kind of this, this um, current pullback in the market. And, you know, do you guys have a sense one way or the other as to whether this is just, you know, again, a temporary pullback, or maybe you have a different opinion. Maybe you think this is 
you know, a precedent to something worse. Okay, sure. Yeah, let, a couple comments on the market. Can you see my chart by any yep. chance? Okay, good. So I thought I'd take this opportunity just to share a chart of the S&P 500 on a weekly basis. So this is the, the top back in, in January, January 4th of 2022. Here we are over a year and a half later, and we still haven't taken out that top in the S&P. And during this retracement from the October low, there's been all of this increasing enthusiasm, you know, now to the point, as John pointed out, that you know, Peter says that everyone thinks we're got a soft landing. We're, we're back off to the old, to the good old times. Personally, I think that this is what's called a wave to bear market rally. Now, whether it's really that or not remains to be seen, um, but there's a lot of reasons why we had this rally. I mean, you could look at alternative intelligence or AI and 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 you know excitement in those kind of stocks. That's probably the biggest reason. On your program recently, Adam, you had a guest that talked about you know liquidity and treasury issuance, and which has also happened this year. And there's always going to be a reason, you know. But if you stand back and just look at the charts, sometimes the charts just make sense. You never you never know. If there's going to be follow through or not, for instance, maybe this is just a 3% pullback and we are going to get the melt up that some people talk about. But to me, if you take a look at the fact that this has been a very, very narrow rally with seven to 10 stocks uh, leading it, followed by a lot of over bullish sentiment, followed by, uh, as we talked about earlier, a number of industries slowing down, at least with you know boots on the ground evidence amongst our clients and prospects. It's much more likely that this area here is is a retracement, a partial retracement. Now, granted, that's a deep retracement. That's close to like it looks like an eighty percent retracement of that pullback, and it's been over a year and a half. So, you know, this has been a a massive top in the market. If I went to a monthly chart and show you that a little bit here, you know, look at look at this blow off of the after COVID. It's just been an insane blow off top. And if this is a retracement of that, you now this is this is just a massive, massive top, if this is a top, which would then conclude that the size of the drop would be commensurately large. That's what basic technical analysis would say. So the, the real question is, is this a so-called wave to top, which would then lead to an acceleration down move? I think it probably is going to. This market has continually frustrated us like that. But if it moves down, and this is the third week down, and if we close up below 44.50, we've kind of put in a little island here. I can go to the daily chart. You can see it's been a pretty measured move down. But if we close down here, we've essentially left behind an island above 44.50, and it would be fairly technically expected for us to see a move down to the 4,200 to 4,300 range pretty quickly. So that's what we're concerned about. Our short-term technical indicators, other indicators, are either re uh, reversed down into caution or are very close to doing so. You know, that coupled with everything else we said here has us, you know, concerned and playing defense. You know, we're still very lightly invested in stocks between five and fifteen percent, depending upon whether you include gold mining stocks in our model. But we think that there's better opportunities to the day uh, in waiting for more downside. Cash is paying 5% while we're waiting. So we, we have got a pretty good chunk of dry powder as well. So that's what we're looking at, expecting some kind of acceleration, but um, have to have a lot of patience because it often takes a long time. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, I did a personal a review of my personal portfolio yesterday and was pleasantly surprised at the income uh, that it's generating now from these safe um, or, you know, on, on a relative basis, safe, uh, you know, income yielding assets like treasuries right now. I mean, it's 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 a big change from uh, the, the past 10 years, <laughs> previous 10 years. Um, all right, guys, we only have a couple minutes left because I believe you guys are, are, are back ended this week. Um, real quick, Mike, while I, I'm, I'll stick with you, um, and John mentioned that uh, you know precious metals have been a bit weak uh, still. Um, uh, I guess anything you want to say about that complex, but I, I have heard several experts in the space, I think you guys included, 
say that we're beginning to just get like almost kind of ridiculous valuations in some of this mining space. Is that true? Yeah, let me show a quick chart here of gold. So we just we looked at S and P a minute ago, which was sitting right at the fifty day moving average. By the way, I didn't mention that. So it's sitting there right at a key support level. Here's gold. This red line is the 50-day moving average. The green line is the 200-day moving average. So we're kind of sitting here in no man's land. This is the futures contract, not the spot contract, but it's 1930 on, on the futures. And I'm and I'm somewhat disappointed to see this. This is almost three weeks of very, very kind of 45-degree straight down action. Now, I would have hoped to see some consolidation after this breakout and then affirming and then a push up through 2000 but it it has not happened yet so it's continuing to frustrate people the miners are badly lagging gold if i were to pull up gdx you'll see that gdx here uh, has been acting much worse than gold it's our opinion that this is a historic um you know difference that will be resolved and, and oftentimes miners underperformed for quite a number of years relative to gold we we frankly think that investors are asleep um or have been lulled asleep as it relates to gold and when gold pops higher certainly above 2000 and, and closes there that gold mining stocks will close this gap but this group is is very very um it's very attractive from a valuation perspective you asked about valuations these companies are making lots of money at gold at 1900 close to 2000 their cost of pulling gold out of the ground or hover around 1200 or so if i go out to the weekly chart on gdx uh, or even the monthly chart you know you can see that it's just been consolidating for a few years here i think ultimately if gold goes up towards 2500 and we see gdx in the 50s but i think that for that to happen it's going to have to make some of that gap up you can see the shape of this chart it's a big triangle but it's hovering near the lower end if i went back to gold you know you see it's a much tighter higher triangle actually a triple top that i think will be taken out to the upside so gold miners are, are lagging down here and and gold itself is having a much nicer looking chart but you know, these companies have cleaned up their balance sheet they're starting to think about acquiring each other they trade in the single digit or high single digit price earnings ratios. They're really profitable with gold at these levels, but no one seems to care. Not yet. And um, I think that's a, that's going to change. But it has been a very long road for gold investors, I will admit. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep watching the action here, obviously. And um, because we're, we're short on time, I'm going to have to wrap it up here. One topic I just want to mention, just so we just get it on the table and we can talk about it next week, is the serious storm clouds that seem to be brewing in China right now um, and the potential knock-on contagion effect that a, a real economic crisis in China could have for the rest of the global economy. Um, just to mention two developments, and there are more, but their largest property developer, Country Garden, is now in default, uh, as it appears, is uh, one of the largest players in the shadow banking system, which is pretty tremendously large over there, a company called Zhongzhi Enterprise Group. Um, so no time to get your guys' reaction to that and do the topic any justice, but I just wanted to put it on people's radars here because this is something that could become a pretty big story going forward, and I, I just wanted folks to have the, the initial context. Um, all right, folks, well, look, uh, John and Mike, thanks for hanging with me for yet another week. Um, a reminder for folks, given uh, the outlook of what's happening on the macroeconomic side, um, we highly recommend, as we always do, that people work with a good financial advisor who takes all of these macro issues into consideration when building a personalized portfolio plan for you and then executing it for you while keeping you very well informed. If you've got one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. If you don't, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthy on endorses, perhaps even John and Mike and their team there at New Harbor. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Only takes you a couple of seconds to fill it out. These consultations, totally free. There's no commitment to work with these advisors. It's just a public service they offer to help as many people as possible position prudently today in advance of what might lie ahead. John, I'll let you have the last word as we uh, we let folks off here. Yeah, I'll just say a sincere thank you, Adam, to you and, and the viewers. Uh, I've got to run to a, a meeting, so uh, I'll keep it real short, and we'll see you, see you next week.
All right, great. Folks, if you enjoyed this uh, these weekly sessions with the team at New Harbor, please vote your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. John and Mike, thanks again for another great week. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Adam. Thank, thank you all. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type, the kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA but for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-US clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.